Welcome back to the Plowcast. I'm Peter Momsen, editor in chief of Plow. And I'm Susanna Black, senior editor at Plow. We're here to talk with Phil Christman and Joey Keegan about two of their pieces in the most recent magazine. And then we'll be talking with Plow editor Joy Clarkson about her new book, Aggressively Happy. And now, welcome to Phil and Joey, here to talk about Christian hardcore and the strange nostalgic community to be found in the YouTube comments of new wave bands. This is what we've come to call the aging hipster wife guy segment of the Plowcast. Right, and uh, speaks to me. Phil Chrisman teaches first year writing at the University of Michigan and is the editor of the Michigan Review of Prisoner Creative Writing. His work has appeared in The Christian Century, Paste, Books and Culture, The Hedgehog Review, and other publications, and he has a great book column uh, at Plow. His most recent book is How to Be Normal. Joey Keegan is a writer and editor at Athwart and The Point, currently living in Chicago. Welcome, Phil and Joey. Phil, you've written this kind of piece that you have to read to understand fully, I think, called Reading the Comments. Um, fans of 1980s post-punk and new wave find community and catharsis online, specifically in the YouTube comments section. And uh, Joey has written a piece about Christian hardcore, the death and life of Christian hardcore, uh, where he tells the story of uh, that a bunch of us who were around, specifically in the 90s and early 2000s, will remember. One theme in both your articles was the relationship between music and community and the kind of strange communities that can be built around music. Could both of you, uh, maybe you start, Phil, just kind of tell tell us a little bit about what you wrote about and why you wrote about it. I think you started off, Phil, uh, in the midst of uh, COVID uh, ennui, uh, staring at your computer screen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this um, I don't think the article's depressing, at least I hope not, but it, it definitely has the most depressed middle-aged man vibes of anything that I think I've ever written, um, which, you know, hope the the result within the article, hopefully, is is funny. I mean, that's what you aim for. No, it's, it's actually genuinely funny. It's extremely, I was, it, it's extremely funny. Yeah. Okay. Well, Distressing, good. but funny. M- mission accomplished, but yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, everybody, uh, everybody suffered COVID differently, uh, and uh, of course, unequally. Um, you know, I'm I'm lucky enough that I, and privileged enough that I, uh, you know, I wasn't suffering in the sense of like risking exposure to to bring middle class people their groceries. I was I was one of those people, so I was I was just suffering the sense of being cooped up all day and not being able to go out. Um, and, and also, you know, the, the, just being suffused with dread all the time. Like, is this what the future is going to look like? I mean, I think in tough times, uh, you know, people revert to the, uh, to the music that is like their home base musically, like whatever, whatever you were a, a huge fan of between the ages of 13 and 18, um, that will serve as a kind of comfort food for you, um, in a way, nothing else will. And it just so happens that my, my comfort food is, uh, the, is bands like Joy Division, which is, who are not at all comforting, actually. <laughs> I found myself listening to that stuff a lot. And I found myself, uh, just glancing at the comments, uh, of, of old, old eighties, you know, post-punk and new wave music videos and uh, I just found that uh, I found myself emoting in response to the things that people were sharing to to a degree that was like, this is this is weird. You know, people would post things about like, <clears throat> you know, uh, I, f- I first heard this song with me girlfriend 38 years ago, and now we've been married all these years, and I wish that Ian Curtis of Joy Division had lived. You know, he famously committed suicide very early on. And, and people sharing these things very uh, very artlessly and very honestly, and I just found myself feeling like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, man, I, uh, me too. <laughs> um, and I thought, okay, well, this is a sign that things are not... Things are not perfectly well in my life. Uh, well, and I, you know, of course they weren't. There was a global pandemic happening. You know, what did I expect? Um, and, and one day uh, I started uh, talking about this on- online with friend of the pod, uh, Viri Huleyat, and she said, 
Phil, you, you, you need to, to write this. You're making me laugh. You need to write about this. You know, you just wrote this book, uh, Phil, um, about how to be normal. You know, we're listening to post-punk, uh, and reading the comments make me you more normal. Is this? I mean, one of the, honestly, one of the, it kind of did make me a little use? more normal. I mean, how to be normal is an essay collection, and and certainly not a uh, any kind of how to. Uh, <clears throat> but um, I I mean I I yes, in the sense that uh, you should reach for some sense of connection with other people. Yes, in the sense that uh, you, you should listen to music, which is something that was like central to my life for years and years and years in my youth. And, and now sometimes, you know, now that I have a vocation and all, all, all that adult kind of grounding stuff, uh, I inexplicably sometimes will forget to listen to records like some kind of crazy person. I don't know how I, I don't know how I became that person, frankly. Um, a person who could forget to listen to records but you know you got to do that and and you've got to uh you, you've got to uh, like find some way of of finding community with other people and for whatever reason uh whatever alphabet soup of uh you know diagnoses i'm working with i forget those very obvious things um and yeah so i do think it helped me be a little more normal the Joey and, and the death and life of Christian hardcore, you describe actually a bit of a different milieu uh, than Joy Division. Um, the earliest bands that I could find uh, are sort of like these late 80s and like early 90s bands from California and Florida and places where, you know, these thriving punk scenes that already existed. Um, uh, yeah, and, and I mean, one of the really interesting things about Christian hardcore and Christian punk rock is that some of its right, it's it's its early roots are something that's kind of derivative, right? It be, it, it starts out as, as this kind of child of punk rock, but then very quickly after that, you know, it starts blossoming in all of these parts of the country that never had punk rock scenes to begin with. Um, they start experimenting with styles of of playing hardcore that really nobody else was doing at the time, and so its early impulse was like, all right, we're gonna we're gonna take this template and twist it in this direction and uh, sing about God rather than about death or whatever, you know, and um, uh, you know, some of the, some of the early bands really, you know, really we're just kind of like, yeah, taking, taking a kind of stock issue punk rock thing and, and just changing it lyrically. Um, but then, yeah, you know, by like the early, early nineties, early to mid nineties, you have these places like, you know, rural Arkansas, uh, you know, so, some other places and, uh, you know, there's some bands that come out of like some parts of Pennsylvania where there weren't really like, you know, thriving punk scenes and places like this where, you know, uh, Memphis, Tennessee, which is, you know, uh, this, this place that, you know, had some kind of punk rock thing sort of, but nothing to the extent of like California. And they just become these hotbeds for this and for this entirely new sort of milieu and community of people making this, making this kind of music. And, um, especially going into like the mid nineties. I mean, they, they start charting some completely new sonic territory that then becomes influential on the level of the whole, right? All these kids in the middle of nowhere with nothing to do, start getting together in the, the very few places that they have to gather church basements, YMCA's, um, you know, coffee shops in some places, uh, Famously in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, which had kind of a Christian hardcore thing, but then they kind of had their own, their own scene. But um, nonetheless, right, there were like some hardcore shows that happened in like a Denny's. Um, just it, any place where any place where you could where you, use an excuse to kind of get together with other young people and just kind of freak out for a little while. But uh, in this case, right, in the case of Christian hardcore, you you know you were sort of freaking out for a particular kind of reason uh, that they you know they they, they were really their, their faith was very earnest. Um, and it was very amateur and kind of like, in many cases, uh, sort of unformed, but they were trying to figure it out with each other. Uh, the, I mean, the very first, you know, I, I think back on this stuff, right? The very first like punk rock, loud, weird music song I ever heard was this California Christian hardcore band called Overcome. I think they formed in like the, like the, like 1989 or something like that, doing a cover of Our God is an Awesome God. And I had no idea what I was listening to. My brother, my brother was like, Joey, I got to play this for you. I was like, I don't know, like eight or nine years old or something. And he plays this thing. And I was just like, what is this guy screaming about? And then he was like, no, you got to listen to the words. And, 
you know, that was the first time I'd ever heard punk rock music in my life. And then, you know, some two or three months later or something like that, my brother drags me to a church basement in Northern Mississippi to see his band play with these other two Christian hardcore bands. It's all these teenage kids just like losing their minds and, um, uh, and talking very earnestly about God in between songs. And it was like this really kind of like incredible and strange experience. And, uh, yeah, it, you know, uh, I, what, what I try to chart in the article is like the, the, the blossoming of this very strange, very kind of, um, I don't know, this, this community of kind of vernacular Christianity that sort of just blows all over the country and then rockets to genuine fame. You know, some of these bands get really huge and it becomes like a, a means of making a huge amount of money. Um, and then uh, in that process of becoming very famous uh, undoes itself and then it collapses very quickly thereafter. So, um, I mean, one of the things, one of the things I don't chart in the, in the piece, uh, and I was thinking about this when reading, when reading Phil's is that, uh, you know, what happened, one of the things that happens kind of in parallel to, to the, the history of this thing, right. Uh, throughout the nineties and in the early two thousands is the development of the internet. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was, I was, I was thinking about how, like when, when I was a kid, you know, like my brother wasn't online, you know, he was just like doing his thing, like, you know, playing with his hardcore band and like crusty Memphis, Tennessee bars and stuff. But I was mostly encountering this stuff online. So I was on like AOL chat rooms, like, uh, when, you know, when like downloading stuff on like Napster and soul seek when I was like 12 years old. Um, and, uh, and there, and there is like, you know, I, I, there is like a, a sort of slow burning, like existing community of this stuff online that I've, I've come into contact with to some extent by publishing this article, I think it does take place uh, in YouTube comments. You know, if you if you look at these old songs uh, from these old Christian hardcore bands, you know, you'll find people being like, you know, I heard this song when I was 11 years old and it changed my life, you know. And um, yeah, so the, the, there's 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 some overlap. Although for me, it like one one of the interesting differences between our articles, and I think Joey, you you kind of put your finger on exactly what this was a couple minutes ago before we started recording. Um, Joey Joey made this remark about him and me both having a kind of aging hipster vibe, which is uh, that was kindness on his part. I because the fact is, I I was was never a hipster. I was too agoraphobic to be a good hipster, and especially before the internet, like. I had to reconstruct the whole genealogy of proto-punk, punk, and post-punk from reading terrible corporate music magazines, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and you would just get a, I, I, I knew which band I, bands I liked, and you would get a glimpse of, you know, oh, well, this, this band influenced Talking Heads or whatever, and I'd be like, oh, really? I gotta write this down, <laughs> you know? And then it would take, I lived in a small, I, I was such a nerd. And, and uh, you know, I lived in a small town too. So sometimes it would be years before I had a chance to actually hear this stuff. So for me, it, part of, I mean, something that's interesting about the article is it it's me finding community almost for the first time around a thing that um, ha, had been kind of a, not totally isolated pursuit but kind of a lonely pursuit for me um at the at the time when i was most avidly pursuing it um and something else you said that, that was interesting when you joey when you were describing christian hardcore as both sonically innovative in a way that then there's like a tributary back to the to the larger hardcore scene which i i would argue like at least the Christian rock that I grew up with, like Christian rock and pop more broadly, like basically the stuff my youth pastor wanted me to listen to instead of talking heads. Uh, this is not true. Like that's, that stuff was, yeah. uh, it was, it was so imitate blatantly imitative in a lot of cases that they, you know, famously used to have these posters at Christian bookstores that are like, if you like this problematic secular band, try this Christian band instead. <laughs> like you could just, it looks like yard goods or something. Um, yeah, I, I wrote about Cornerstone Festival. That was sort of the, the beginning of my yeah. of my piece was thinking about Cornerstone and like the history of it and the role that it played in fomenting this world. And I, I went to Cornerstone in 2000 with my with my brother um, and his his band played and 
you know, yeah, like, you know, a good solid 70%, you know, as, as like sort of fun and interesting and, and, and uh, I don't know, kind of cool in this sort of just sociological way as Cornerstone was. I mean, yeah, a vast, an overwhelming majority of the bands that played there were like explicitly and deliberately like, all right, we like this secular band. Let's do this exact thing mm-hmm. with lyrics that will be marketable to a different target audience. And, you know, this it was like, you know, these the, the record labels that existed through, you know, in the early 90s were largely doing this kind of maneuver. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the right, the, the, the record, like uh, the, there's a, a, a sort of blossoming of record labels that pop up to sort of release these Christian hardcore bands. Uh, and then all of those are kind of like the exception that proves the rule in Christian music, right? These were bands that couldn't get signed to these derivative Christian labels because they didn't, they didn't do the thing right. They did. They weren't like, all right, if you like, you know, uh, X, you know, like, uh, if you like Minutemen, we're Minutemen, but we suck. <laughs> yeah, we yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there's there's multiple roads to to boring conformity. You know, there's the yeah, yeah. There, yeah. There's the like I um, I'm I'm doing art as a form of ministry, and I don't care about the art, and that leads to a kind of stifling conformity. But then there's also the I'm choosing success, which is one of the oldest ways to become boring as an artist you know, that there is, but, but what, and, and I want to, as a quick sidebar, I want to say that in the nineties, there was briefly a kind of Christian art rock scene that I think also had the potential to, to become something that, that had some of the admirable features that Christian hardcore did. I'm thinking bands like over the, or like early over the Rhine, Innocence Mission, uh, Danielson mm-hmm. Family, uh, Sufjan, when he first started, um so it, it, rosie thomas so it wasn't yeah, yeah. i don't, I don't want to yeah, daniel danielson family was amazing i mean that's uh Star, starflyer 59 also incredible stuff oh you know? i i can't believe i forgot starflyer 59 <laughs> i mean Star, yeah. Star, yeah that that dude yeah, he still puts out cool. records for one yeah. and he you know he was like he he was like sunny day real estate or something i mean he he like formed he formed a sound that then a bunch of other bands that had nothing to do with Christian music picked up and then, and sort of continued for it. I mean, he was like a, he was a, a, a genre forming like mm-hmm. game changer. Uh, yeah. And then everybody kind of forgot that he had done it. I mean, the first, the first yeah. few Starfly 59 albums are like uh, these kind of like, you know, college rock shoegaze classics that uh, came into the world and were super, super popular. And all these people listened to it and all these people formed bands that sounded like it. And then people stopped listening to him. And so the genealogy kind of got broken, but yeah, yeah I mean, he, he was, well, he was and, doing something nobody else was doing. And you mentioned Sunny Day Real Estate. I mean, Jeremy Enoch, if I remember yeah, correctly, yeah, yeah. He, had, he had a violent conversion experience and made this like incredible solo record that this girl, I had this horrible horrible like unending crush on in college it was her favorite record of all time so of course that just magnifies the artistic power uh uh, what return of the frog king something like that yeah no Um, jeremy enoch another guy who continues to make records and they're all amazing i mean the guy has been like he's a workhorse and uh he's got a voice of an angel and he still seems to he still seems to have this really earnest faith that he's singing it's amazing i mean the the he's he's an anachronism now but uh uh, he's one, a, a beautiful and amazing the, actor. Yeah, the talents, the talents there. I, but what yeah. were you, what you were saying about like the combination of like being serious about your artistry um, and and creating something genuinely new, and also having this incredibly earnest and real faith, um, kind of reminds me of um, the the music some of the weirder music that's associated with kind of the the jesus movement moment of the late 60s early 70s there was this Mm -hmm. there was this compilation that came out a few years ago from i forget where that was it was like jesus music volumes one or and two or something like like that it's it's christian garage rock psychedelia um art and art rock from late from like very late 60s through early 70s and it, it's it, it was like listening to nuggets or something i mean um, yeah it, 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 for those tuning in at home nuggets is a classic compilation of 60s garage rock that was a huge influence on patty smith and other uh great artists anyway yeah it was it but it was it was that good it was like how how did this stuff not get famous um and, and it similarly had that 
quality of like I'm I'm questing both aesthetically and spiritually in a very was, real way. And it's like it why it, why is it so hard for Christians to sustain those moments? I I, I keep mm-hmm. coming back to that as as artists like it, it, well, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I think that it's 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 easy to forget uh, the size and scope and influence of Cornerstone, right? It, I mean, it was, but it was like this, you know, it was this enormous thing. Like every Christian band in America wanted to play it, and many of them did. And like, yeah, and it's all these like all these kind of like you know hippies that you know had their soul grabbed by the Lord and you know <laughs> playing prog rock about Jesus, you know, and like, and then they, they go, it's they, so uh, rad. Oh, it's great. It's, it's so, so weird and cool. And, and, yeah. and it's, it's this kind of a bizarre American kind of thing. But um, yeah, I mean, as your question about how to sustain that kind of artistic energy, I mean, um, I remain really interested in, you know, sort of new developments in music. And, and I'm always trying to sort of, keep my finger on the pulse it gets harder as you get older right mm-hmm. you know I, I'm, I'm sort of losing the uh, <laughs> losing the thread losing i don't my edge <laughs> yeah well and i don't know what these kids are listening <laughs> to man i mean they play you know i supervise students uh, at, at a university and they play me stuff that they're really into and it's just like uh i don't know man it just sounds extruded from a from a from a machine or something but uh but there are i mean there are still like there is still a a world of like you know, interesting, uh, Christian stuff happening. I mean, me without you, maybe one of the best thing to ever come out of of the, I mean, I say, I say best, I'm not, I don't say this arbitrarily, just like one of the the most like unique and forward thinking and like lyrically, just absolutely breathtaking. Like, I mean, those guys are, are, are absolutely incredible musicians and they put out, you know, just wonderful album after wonderful album. And I think they're, they're just calling it quits now. I mean, which is, which is, yeah, they just did a big uh, reunion last last summer, right? So Aaron Weiss, yeah. their their lead singer, um, used to be a friend of mine and used to visit the Rudolph community a bunch in the early 2000s. Um, one of their songs, weirdly enough, um, several of their songs, weirdly enough, are by uh, the uh, the founder of our publishing house, what? Elza von Holander. Yeah, he <laughs> stole it. <laughs> But just to show the weirdness, the weirdness and the earnestness that you were talking about, right? These are people who are super serious about, you know, new ways of imagining faith. Um, I, you know, I, I was personally super snooty about Christian music. And then I got to know Aaron and, and Me Without You is, is worth listening to. For context, Joey is literally wearing a Me Without You t-shirt right now. Like, Pete, you, you've got to make, you've got to like facilitate this. <laughs> oh, for real? The, the, these guys need to be friends. You, yeah, no, you, you got to connect me. To the, I mean, like I, I've been, I not only love listening to me without you, I'll put on the record and sit down and read the lyrics and like, and, and in the, in the, um, the liner notes, I mean, he tends to like tell you who he's referencing. It'll be like a line that'll have like Wittgenstein in parentheses or St. John of the cross. I mean, like the, the, the guy's on a totally different level, but, but which is to say that like, I mean, I think of them as, as being really one of like the great American rock and roll bands like ever. And uh, they're completely underrivative. There's been nobody who's ever sounded like them before. And uh, they they have, a, a, you know, the, the yeah, like the, the, the depth of the lyricism, the depth of the kind of intellectualism going into the thing. And they're a Christian band and they've always been a Christian band. And they never did the thing that a bunch of other Christian bands did, which is to stop being a Christian band and to say, oh, you know, we were we were always just kind of Christians in a band. You know, we were, you know, eh, whatever, whatever. Right. They never did right. that. I mean, that, that's the thing, right? Like Christian artistic expression probably should sound more like. Um, not literally sound like, but in in the the effect it has on the listener of making you what am i listening to mm-hmm. uh right. it should sound more like captain beefheart than yeah. <laughs> you know uh th- then like uh i don't know who who is then like michael w smith or you know to i don't know if i don't know if he's even worth picking on anymore he was ubiquitous in my childhood um but, you know, it should sound like people try people whose universes have been upended uh, who are now trying to like map a whole 
new space. Mm -hmm. Well, and with me, without you, right, there was also a connection to a, uh, a level of social concern and an awareness of a wider world beyond just me and my faith and my personal turmoil, which I'm going to tell you about in the next 60 songs, right? Um, so when, when, uh, when we were in touch with him a lot, for instance, uh, Shane Claiborne was just starting his Simple Way community in Philadelphia. They were connected up with me without you. There was this whole scene of... Um, different people getting involved uh, around issues like uh, the death penalty um, and uh, criminal justice issues. You know, I'm, I'm not sure to the degree that that spills over to their music, but it was definitely sort of informing uh, the kind of stuff that they were thinking about um, in a way that that cornerstone, I'm not sure that was there, you know, uh, like, hey, ska's hot this year. Let's make a Christian ska band, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's I think it's a really good that's a really good point. Like. Yeah, so much of, of, of what like Christian contemporary music has always been is this kind of solipsistic, yeah, like my personal journey and, you know, and right, I always play this game uh, whenever you're listening to this stuff. It's just like, all right, is this person singing about God or Christ or whatever, or are they just singing about a love interest? And half the time it's indistinguishable. It could be one or the other, right? Um, and uh, yeah, it, it, I mean, which one of the, one of the things that, that really that always really struck me about Christian hardcore, right? Is that um, in the years before it became this kind of like, you know, hot marketable commodity by, you know, like uh, uh, these, these con record conglomerates, it was very much this, this effort at building a, building the church out in this new way, right? Making communities that were not just music scenes, but that were concerned with, you know, yeah, these with, with, with social matters, which with, with, with trying to kind of, you know, make, make a more just world uh, in the light of the gospel and, and working like really work. I mean, like the, you know, these, these bands who, who formed to perform this stuff. I mean, they'd regularly do volunteer work at their churches. I mean, half of these guys ended up becoming sort of youth ministers or something and like trying to, trying to participate in something, right. There, there was always a, cl a close tie between like, you know, religious communities that weren't music scenes and these music scenes and, and, and the, the Christian hardcore bands kind of straddled that and in a very uncomfortable way most of the time because, right, the music scenes that they were trying to perform in and most of these places didn't want them around. Uh, if you talked to like, you know, hardcore kids and punks or whatever in like the 90s and early 2000s, they, ha they hated these guys. And, and I mean, like a, a lot of it was was unfair, right? Uh, it was just simply that you believe anything makes you a mark to be um, to be ridiculed, um, because the, the the punk thing was so nihilistic, uh, explicitly, and and you know there was this kind of you had to style which yourself is, as like I'm I'm above it all, right? I'm, I'm which is also a historical because punk was yeah punk was the Sex Pistols in the first instance, but punk was also the Clash, you know. And Fugazi, I mean, you know, Fugazi, like, yeah, exactly. minor threat and Fugazi. Like, and, I, and I mean, all you're, you're really, really like, I, I remember meeting like, yeah, hardcore kids of the more like, I listen to crass variety, you know, yeah. um, and I mean, they always embodied the paradox that that you that you then later saw in like the more militant new atheist types, like ten years ago, where um boy you you in particular are not in any position to tell people not to believe in things because yeah. you are absolute um you you are completely fanatical i've i i know 20 fundamentalists less fanatical than you are <laughs> well you got those the straight edges going you know no, I, I I think of i think of the i mean the christian hardcore thing and the straight edge thing there was a there was a lot of bleed over right um that was one of the one of the places actually where I think there was a lot more kind of cross subcultural collaboration between like the straight and right. Uh, Chris Morgan wrote a really beautiful essay about this years ago, and I don't remember where he, where he published it. It might have been in uh, I don't know. I I can't, I can't say, but he but he's he. This is a question he's always thinking about. Is kind of this 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 strange connection between the straight edge hardcore scene and like Christian punk. And um, one of the things that he always points out is that Ian Mackay from Minor Threat slash Fugazi, his dad was an Episcopal minister. And mm -hmm. so the, the, the early energy for Straight Edge was like, was like directly from this kind of like, you know, Protestant moral sort of sense 
that gets mm-hmm. channeled into something else because he did he you know he wanted to leave this stuff behind but right it changes in content but remains kind of uh, mm-hmm. uh identical in form wherever it is it's, it's completely worth reading on this question and, and and chris morgan i always think of as being the sort of virgil through the the 90s you know counter <laughs> counter slash subcultural uh, inferno um but but yeah the, the 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 straight edge the straight edge christian and hardcore thing is um i mean and and it remains it remains a, a connection, right? Like I think that of, of a lot of the people that I know who who still, you know, decades down the line, as unpopular it's become, still consider themselves to be straight edge. Uh, many of them are are Christians. <laughs> that they're they're fine with being with with these unpopular labels. <laughs> right. They get used to it. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. a little like being a Christian pacifist communitarian, I would imagine. <laughs> You're uncool, but you get used to it. Yeah, you get used to it. You know, <laughs> people can get used to anything. I think someone once said. <laughs> Heard all the insults. I know how this goes. One of the weird things about post-punk in particular is that it has really come back with a vengeance. And, you know, you see just like random kids walking around. They're like 16 years old wearing the Unknown Pleasures shirt mm-hmm. with the lines on it. And I guess I'm sort of curious uh, what you think about this kind of the strange afterlife of post-punk and being a being the kind of like or ha- having the kind of cultural status that it does. I base these generalizations just on what I observe of my students, um, but that's a that's a reasonably big sample. I think um, I don't think that pop culture history exists in the same way for younger people. Um, I think it's it's. That, that it did for me. Um, I, it's a, there's just a million mood boards that you can reach to, um, when you, uh, need to do whatever people it is, people use m- mood boards for. I, I, I can't, I don't understand that phenomenon, but it's yeah. Every, every, every past moment in pop cultural history is like a, a, a Pinterest thing. Um, it's, it's all, it's, it's a flat collage, uh, you know, that you can, you can pull from if you're an artist or it, it, or if you're just looking for something to listen to, or if you're just looking for something, uh, to wear the t-shirt of, which, you know, in a, in a basic way, that's, that's kind of good because I like that, um, you know, some young person who encounters a reference to the Velvet Underground doesn't have to wait six months until mom happens to be going to the, to the department store several towns over and, you know, tag along and then buy it surreptitiously uh, because your mom's a fundamentalist and she won't let you buy it. She's not going to let you buy it tape called the velvet underground and nico with a big phallic looking banana on the cover uh is this they, a personal a story from her no 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 this is a universal <laughs> gen x experience yeah. uh, okay yeah, yeah. We, y- y- y'all have been there um y- you know i mean people don't have to i'm glad for people not to have to to do all the work you know that i i used to have to do um but you suffered you suffered to make your sort of pet. I'm not really yeah. interested in using that in a in a kind of like, I don't know. These are fake gamer girls because they were never picked. To, I'm not interested in using that as a, a <laughs> bar to entry at all. I, I, if it's good art, I want people that to have access to it. But yeah, I noticed a kind of new wave revival as early as as the mid 2000s, and I think I mean. One, I kind of initially I I liked it just because you know um, this is a simulacrum of stuff I enjoy listening to. So of course I'm not gonna you know it, it's better than Muzak. Uh, it, Inter yeah Interpol that sounds nice. The Strokes that sounds nice. Uh, modest the the one Modest Mouse song that just sounds so much like Gang of Four that it's kind of unbelievable. Sure you know I why not? You know, if, if I can't have, if I can't have a uh, gourmet pizza, then Domino's is fine. Um, well, the LCD sound system played a show on Saturday night live recently. I mean, they're, they're like a new wave throwback mm-hmm. from top yeah. to bottom. Them, you know? them I could never get into. I was just like, okay, so there's going to be a burst of fuzz noise and then he's going to talk. And then there's another, <sighs> And then he's going to talk more. And then he's going to market his own brand of coffee. And then we don't know, you know, yeah. 
Oh, sure. <laughs> I mean, you know, he's got to, he's got to eat, but geez. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think at a certain point I started having the reaction to all of it that Mark Fisher des- describes having when Arctic monkeys were big. Um, Google Mark Fisher, Arctic monkey monkeys, uh, those of you listening at home, because it's a, it's a great piece, but he just talks about feeling like, you know, look, if new wave really, and, and post punk in particular, um, meant anything to you, then what you want to do is have it inspire you to make newer things rather than imitate it. Like, Mm-hmm. This is the, it's the wrong way to keep faith with the spirit of that art, or really, I mean, any halfway good art to, to, is, is to, to sort of subside into mere imitation of it. It's the old adage of Ezra Pound, right? Make it new. New. <laughs> yeah. Make it new. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it, it, it makes me think, right. Uh, Matt Brunig wrote this essay, um, a year or two ago that was sort of reflecting on the question of scare uh, sort of post scarcity in art right like now that you can just access all of this stuff with the click of a mouse it means that it's not going to be nearly as special or sort of um it's not going to have as nearly a, 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 a sort of existential status as this stuff did in the past right so yeah like starflyer 59 now is just 90s it's no you know it's no longer like this strange seattle guy who moved in this particular world and had these particular connections and right it's, released it's on no longer labels. like a pirate radio station from another planet which is how yeah. this used to feel yeah yeah and like right then and, and, and you know these art objects like you know when when i was growing up like it was hard to get records i remember like ordering stuff through mail order catalogs and like um you know you had to like really seek out play the, oh, the yeah. ways to get these things you had to go see a band at their show in order to get it like half the time um and uh right and so so brunig's thing is like well you know okay so the the, the art object becomes devalued in a particular kind of way or it takes on a new kind of life or it has a different kind of being and it's right it's very flat and so on and so forth but it's all worth it because of the uh it's it's good to simply have these things in people's hands i think that i think that article actually made me a defender of scarcity like i i like i i like i like that christian hardcore music meant something for the participants in it and that you had to like work to find it and that you know and and so uh, so on one hand right and I, I i i'm thinking now of like the strange the strange thing of like if you go to a museum and you see these objects taken out of monasteries and they're just kind of hanging on the wall like to one extent like i'm glad that i can see it right um but there, but isn't there something that's like inherently and, and and sort of irrevocably tragic about the removal of that thing from a kind of context in which it's like an object of devotion, right? Like like Christian Harker music was devotional to a large extent. The early stuff was was really it was like um, there was a kind of liturgy to it. You know, it's like the, the, these the, these kids are, are are trying to like worship God through making and 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 listening to and attending sort of performances of this music, and like. On one hand, I, you know, I, I, I'm glad in a way that, you know, that teenagers or whatever who are just scrolling through Spotify might sort of have some, one of these things spit into their algorithm, their other algorithmically derived playlist or something like that's kind of interesting to me. But on the other hand, like what made this stuff so urgent and what made it so uh, important for me as a young, as, as a young person was that it was it wasn't just an art object. It was, it was a piece of a world, right? But then what that means is that a little bit of that, a a little bit of a radioactive object, like a, a fragment of a radioactive object from a radioactive world, uh, got thrown into this person's algorithm on a particular day. And we can't, I don't think we can predict the impact of that, especially if we're talking about art that is, is sacred in some sense. I, mm-hmm. I think that means as with, as with anything um, that involves kind of the banalization of Christianity, um, I, 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 think, I think that that radioactivity never fully goes away. And, and that we can't, we can't assume that the impact, um, 
that we that we know like what the impact will be that that we that we can't write off that that kid isn't going to have something it won't be your experience and in that way yes it's all tragic um because death is tragic aging is tragic no yeah. i'm sorry, i don't i don't i don't mean to be like super super morbid but it's like yeah, I mean, no one will ever again have the t- teenage experience that you or I had, and nor will I ever have my dad's teenage experience. And that's inherently, like, we need to just Im- admit that that's that does suck. Like, the mm-hmm. grief we feel over that is legitimate, but I don't think we can write off the possibility that people are having other kinds of experience with art, or are still capable of having kinds of experiences. Uh, experiences with art that are still life-changing in ways that we couldn't foresee and that will then themselves be uh be surpassed and and replaced uh uh, unless jesus comes back next week (laughs) um so i I don't know i try to i try to maintain i I try to maintain both a sense of mourning about that stuff and also uh, an openness to possibility yeah, this, you know, there, there will be a time for moshing and a time for streaming, a time. For there you go. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> this too is vanity. <laughs> yeah, nice. Well, thanks, uh, Joey and Phil. This has been a great conversation. It's been great having you on. And uh, yeah, check out these articles, dear listeners. And uh, we'll also drop links to some of the other pieces we talked about and to some of the bands. And now, we're very pleased to welcome Plough's own Joy Clarkson. Joy has just completed her doctorate in theology, Imagination and the Arts at St. Andrews University in Scotland, and is the host of the podcast Speaking with Joy. She's also a contributing editor to Plough. Joy, it is so good to have you here. Where are you calling in from? I am Zooming in from my flat in Oxford, um, and it's very fun to, to actually be interviewed because usually I'm the one interviewing. I feel like of all the people, you and Pete are, are the ones I'll let interview me. We'll beware your attempts to interview us, Joy, <laughs> because we want to talk about your new book, uh, Aggressively Happy. Which I will show to the camera. Why don't you describe what this project was and how it came to be? The anecdote about how it came to be is also fantastic. I think that in some ways it came from spending too much time on Twitter. And one of the things, I actually quite enjoy Twitter. I think there are lots of interesting people to encounter there. And what I always say is, it's a bit of like, I mean, heavens, I encountered you all there. Um, I say it's a little bit like an echo chamber. And so if you yell obscure things that you're interested in, like um, literature, Jane Austen, philosophy, theology, you will discover these strange people who will yell back at you. And that's a wonderful, delightful thing. But the other thing I discovered on Twitter, which is perhaps just a, I think, a megaphone of ordinary life, is that there was this kind of, uh, occasionally I would encounter this very almost angry response to happiness or joy or delight. Um, This kind of sense that if you were really a wise person, if you were really somebody who cared about the world, cared about your faith, that you would be someone who is kind of cynical or serious all the time. And so whenever I would tweet anything kind of like happy or lighthearted or whatever, I would get these very intense negative responses. And one of those, which I had tweeted something kind of innocuous, like about, about tea or lipstick or something. And this tweeter responded and said, this is disgusting. You're so aggressively happy. And um, I, I took it just kind of on the chin. I thought it was a bit funny because, you know, uh, people are funny on the internet. Um, but I, I, I pondered it for a moment and I thought, yeah, I am aggressively happy um, because I think to find joy and, and to keep a sense of soft heartedness and innocence and openness, which I think is necessary for various reasons that I go into the book. Uh, I think in our world, it takes, it takes some assertiveness, takes some intentionality. And so I kind of playfully put that into my bio, but then it just kind of led me to thinking about how we think about happiness, how we think about joy and how we think about these as somehow shallow emotions or, or things that are not as deep or not as profound when actually I think that living a life of, of joy, of hope, of delight is in some ways kind of a resistance to the cynicism of our world, the, uh, the despair 
the hopelessness and is actually something that adds a great deal to to the people around us and also that tells the truth about reality which is that we think that we live in a good world created by a good god who actually likes us and wants it to be redeemed and i think that kind of is the core of the book is getting to the fact that actually being someone who is delighted um with reality is a part of being in touch with the goodness of life and so that's a rambly way of saying that i wrote this book uh, to to rebuke the idea that cynicism is somehow deep and to help people kind of have practical steps on how to how to be happy, how to enjoy things. And then um, the book itself is just it's a collection of 10 uh, essays that are somewhat autobiographical, somewhat uh, literary, theological, kind of pondering various aspects of what it takes to be aggressively happy in the world. We're, as we're recording this in late March, of course, the war in the Ukraine is going. And uh, there's a version of the argument that you just described right now, um, which is that we should only be focusing on the war, that if we're serious, there's this terrible, terrible thing happening, um, that this is really the only thing that ought to occupy us, uh, that we ought to be talking about and focusing on. Now, I notice in, in your book, you uh, refer a few times, I think, to C.S. Lewis's essay on learning in wartime. So I was just wondering if you'd want to, you know, what does it mean to talk about being happy when we know something like this war in the Ukraine is going on? And of course, there's not only in the Ukraine, there, is there bad things going on? Uh, I think I would say there's, there's three ways, three things to think about that. Um, the first is that I start the book by talking about a a quite a heavy time in my life when I just wasn't convinced that life was a a good thing, which maybe sounds intense, but I think that people have experienced that at various times. And I think it's um, hard not to feel that sometimes when you look at the world that we're in. And one of the things that um, two things kind of pulled me out of that one was looking, was having this sense, uh, which in some ways was being convinced of it, but also kind of just having a little bit of a mystical experience of life is good. And part of the reason that we have these profound um, reactions of injustice and anger and and grief is because we have this sense that life is meant to be good deep down to its core. And part of that for me was also meditating on the Beatitudes, right? We, We know these most famous sayings of Jesus, which are Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn. You know, these are these are core to the Christian tradition, to the Bruderhof. And um, and what struck me was when I learned that 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 Markarios in Greek could be translated as blessed, but it could also be translated as happy or lucky or many other things. And that, that have to do with this kind of this lightness. And what strikes me about that is that each one of those things, they are, you know, it's people who are grieved people who are poor, people who are uh, hungering for righteousness that they are not currently experiencing. It's all these different, these senses of lacks. And yet there's there, it is possible to experience blessedness and happiness in the midst of great sorrow and turmoil. So I think I'm, I'm giving a long rambly answer for this, but the first thing is to say that I think this is a part of reality is experiencing blessedness, experiencing happiness in the midst of great trial. Pivoting that to saying that I actually think that it's almost impossible for us to respond to injustice without some notion of the blessedness of life, without some notion that the reason we take, we feel such sorrow when we see children, families, um, mothers, children being, being turned out of their house, being afraid, is because we know that they should be learning and growing and have access to easy things. And so I think that in some ways being in touch with that that happy heart of reality is necessary for being open-hearted enough to respond to the grief that we experience in the world. And then I think the final thing I would say is that this is not a book about just being happy all the time. I think it's a book about being open to reality And I think that being open to reality is, I think at the core of reality is goodness, is blessedness, is happiness. 
Um, but being open to reality also means that you are open to the reality of the broken world that we live in. And I think that that requires being willing to, the first chapter is called befriend sadness. It's, it's being willing to really reckon with the real brokenness, the real disappointment, the real sadness of life. But I actually think that a full embrace of those things allows us to be more in touch with reality and therefore able to be happy when things are redeemed. So that's a, a rambly answer, but I think part of it is happiness is still a part of reality, even when there's deep brokenness. I think we need to be in touch with that sense of blessedness to respond reasonably to injustice and to know how to react well. Um, and that really the book is less about just being happy all the time and more about being in touch with reality, which I think is blessed, um, which means that sometimes we also need to learn very intentionally how to reckon with our sorrow and our anger. I, you know, I, I describe this as sort of self-helpy and I think, you know, it is, but it's also in the tradition of philosophical exercises, I want to say, and it's getting back to a kind of understanding of philosophy as a way of life or philosophy as practices. Um, and I was thinking about that as you were talking, because one thing that it's not is in the tradition of what a lot of those sort of philosophy as a way of life books from like the second and third century um, AD were, which is this is not a stoic book. So this is not a book, you know, there is a lot, there's this tradition in philosophy, which is stoicism, which basically, you know, has to do with like, you can't control what's going to happen. And therefore, but what you can control is your expectation and your own internal sense of like um, reality. And it's very much kind of like, it, it's a philosophy that expects very little of life. Um, and there's a certain way to read your book, which would sort of be a stoicish reading of it, where it's like, let's kind of try to do the be your best to do stuff to your, to your internal world so that you are responding as best you can to the external, so that, so that you're safe from the external world, I guess, is one way to put it. Um, and there are a lot of kind of self-helpy books that are that kind of like, do your best to become safe from the external world. And that seems like fundamentally not what you're doing with this book. Um, it seems to me that the set of sort of instructions, there's like each, each of these chapters begins with a, a verb. Um, these are meant to open you up to the actual external world, um, which mm -hmm. you, you know, is a, as you say, a, a joyful place. It's a fundamentally good place. And so it's not to make yourself safe from that, but it's actually to, in some way, get yourself in touch with that. And your hypothesis is, it seems to me, if you are like not experiencing that blessedness, that, that happiness, you're in some way not in full, in real touch with the real world. You're sort of in some kind of like false world. Does that ring any bells for you? Yeah, I think that it's interesting you use the word safety because um, one of the first people I quote in the book is Julian of Norwich, who, um, you know, is this wonderful uh, 14th century mystic. Um, and one of the things that she orbits around is the problem of evil and safety. So she has this sense of why can we live in this beautiful world where God lets bad things happen, but she, she returns over and over again to this idea that God is keeping us very safe. And uh, she says this over and over again, and she has this vision of God holding um, a hazelnut in his hand. And it's this little thing. And she's like, oh my gosh, it could just disintegrate. Like, wh why do we think reality could continue? It could just fall apart at any moment. And then she says, but then God said to me, I made it. I care. I love it. And I care for it. And there's this sense that her sense of God's safety, then as she thinks about suffering and trials and difficulty, it means that fun, the most fundamental thing is that we are safe. We are loved. Nothing can ultimately veer us off course. And of course, there's many kind of philosophical things to unpick with that and providence and all that. But there's this sense that if we are safe, fundamentally, the no suffering, no tribulation, no um nothing can really unroot that, that essential okayness. And I think the thing I, the chapter I got to that mostly in was the chapter on accepting love. But I think that my sense is that nothing can really make you safe in this world. 
right? You, you, it's just a fragile, broken, difficult, um, you know, it's just, it's a, it, it is a fragile world. That's what it is to be a human. So I don't think there's any kind of efforts you can make really to make yourself less or more safe. I think that what the book is about is coming to the place where you know that the most fundamental reality is that you are, that you are, that God made you, God loves you and God cares for you. And the more you know that, the more you are able to kind of have skin in the game of the world, right? If I know that I'm fundamentally okay, that I, that, that God holds me in the palm of his hand, like a hazelnut, then that frees me up both to uh, love people tremendously, to have, to be willing to be hurt, to be willing to um, risk. It also frees me to be willing to um, to enjoy and not be embarrassed because I, I don't have to worry all the time about what people think about me. It also frees me to be willing to give up my life for a cause that I think is worthwhile. Um, but yeah, that is about, it is this kind of external facing thing. And I think that, you know, blessedness, happiness is seen in the, the fullness of that would be Jesus, right? And the final chapter is called give yourself away. And I think that a full happiness is one that knows itself to be so blessed, secure, safe, fundamentally, that you get to share in the life of Christ, which is a continual pouring out of yourself. And that pouring out is not a loss of yourself, right? We don't believe that Jesus became less by pouring himself in the world, but that we get to share in this divine life of giving more and more of ourselves to the world and, and feeling safe enough not to hold on to things. So that, that I think is kind of the core of the book is the sense that you cannot give yourself safety. God has given you safety. The more you know that, the more you can turn towards the world and give yourself away and experience the blessedness of that reality. I think we need to talk about the most controversial chapter in this book, <laughs> book. Mm-hmm. Uh, which has, you know, even today, uh, gotten some pretty strong language from, from plow readers do you want to talk about your um, your unusual the rehabilitation, claim? The, the rehabilitation of Mr. Collins, the rehabilitation and of Jane Mr. Collins. Austin's novel, uh, <laughs> Pride and Prejudice. So we published, uh, with your permission, as an excerpt from your book, uh, in which you mm. embark on the project of Mr. Collins's rehabilitation. Now there was there was there's been a lot of comment today. Mm. Right. So Mr. Collins is the odious clergyman in Pride and Prejudice, who is set to inherit Longbourn um, from the Bennetts. Uh, Mr. Bennett, yeah, I think I want to write a follow-up book in which I just write a chapter about how terrible Mr. Bennett is. Like I have I have such profound antipathy towards Mr. Bennett. Um, so so Mr. Bennett has five children, daughters, and the his estate is going to Mr. Collins, who is a clergyman who comes and he's like, going to do the family favor and marry one of the five daughters, right? Seems like a pretty rational course of action um, for Regency era, trying to, you know, keep, keep the house and the family. Um, and everyone just hates Mr. Collins, right? I mean, um, he's, he's, it's funny though. So my main thing that I, I find amusing about it is I'm just like the the hatred of Mr. Collins is not justified, right? Before I get to rehabilitating Mr. Collins in a like in a and you know setting up as a as a model of virtue, um, the there are so many other characters worth hating more than Mr. Collins, right? Like the real the real reason people seem to mis- mis- dislike Mr. Collins is all right. So he asks Lizzie to marry him. She's like, no, he's like, oh, you're just playing with me. And she's like, no, I literally don't want to marry you. And he's like a bit ashamed <laughs> and goes back. But like, you know what? Who amongst us hasn't from like misread signals? Um, and also like, this is the thing, that that era of like Mr. Collins being a bad guy, him being awkward at the party and stuff. You know who else is awkward at parties? You know who else gives unwanted um, uh, in, uh, proposals to women that then doesn't accept their no. Mr. Darcy, Mr. Darcy does exactly those things, but we're like, well, Mr. Darcy's rich and he's handsome. So it's actually kind of like mysterious and cool when he does it. Whereas Mr. Collins does it, it's just selfish. So 
that element of Mr. Collins, I, I'm not even making an argument for him. I'm just saying that we should maybe reflect on the fact that we often equate people being irritating with them being bad. And I, as some, I think that's simply uh, an incorrect um, reading. And furthermore, the book is called Pride and Prejudice. That is not just describing how the characters in the book act. It's also describing how we read. And I think the fact that we have this profound prejudice towards Mr. Collins, even though he's like really at the end of the day, not a bad dude is a part of our, it's a part of reading. It is, it is the book reading us. It is the book reading the fact that we are prejudiced, that we would rather hate on a socially inept um, doofus than, um, than on like an actual man who ruins the futures of his five daughters or, you know, various other people. So that's, that's the, you know, everyone shouldn't hate Mr. Collins. The reason I put Mr. Collins in the book is, you know, a lot of this is the book is, I mean, you know, profound. I don't want to say it's profound, but it's about like the spiritual things that keep us happy in the world. I do also think that there are certain elements of life, which are practical. They are the book of Proverbs, right? They're just, if you do these things, your life will be easier. If you do these other things, your life will be harder. And I think Mr. Collins has a, has a worldly, he is, he is, has a worldly aptitude. Is that the right word? He is, he knows what he's doing when it comes to just like arranging his earthly affairs. And, um, and I think he does that pretty well. And he has this great mixture of like, he knows what he wants, which is he wants a wife. He wants to do a good job at his, at his preaching. And you know what, again, like he's a bad preacher. I'm, I, I would probably take Mr. Collins over a lot of the preachers I have heard uh, in the Church of England. Bless it. Um, again, not something to blame him for. Yeah, he wants a wife. He wants a quiet life. He he goes after that in a way which is admirable, right? He he tries Lizzie. She says no. He's a little bit hurt, but then at the end of the day, he gets another a, a somebody who suits him better, and he doesn't resent Lizzie. So I think that in his kind of there's actually something in his lack of self-awareness that uh, leads him to happiness that I think if other people, that I think we could learn from the mixture of him being quite contented. He's good at enjoying what he has. He's good at having some ambitions, but not getting eaten alive by them. And, and I also think he's a pretty good example of how to accept rejection because I think that that's something we all have a hard time with. So that's my pitch for Mr. Collins. Okay, so almost 12 rules for life from Mr. Collins. <laughs> I mean, you are making what you are making is a, a very good case. That, so one of the, the sort of sayings that has developed um, uh, among my friends when attempting to assess whether or not someone ought to have been Me Too'd is cringe is not crime. And it is a very important principle. You can be cringy at a woman, and that does not mean that you are being criminal towards her. He is very cringy towards Lizzie. Mm -hmm. But he should not be me too. That I think is something that we can agree on. Cringe is not crime. Cringe is not crime. I do also want to talk about the other chapter that was, I mean, there we could talk about each of these chapters, but I think um, that would take a great deal of time. And anyway, people should just buy and read the book. Um, I do want to talk about Expect the End of the World. So this is essentially the last chapter, mm -hmm. second to last chapter. Um, and this is another one of the chapters where you have a quotation from On Learning in Wartime. Can you talk about what it means to, like, why expecting the end of the world um, will help us to live a happy life and what you gather from the uh, various, um, you know, monks who live their lives being about to be attacked by Vikings? Well, I guess, um, so... So that chapter, um, to some extent, I'm kind of excavating experiences in my life at various points. And that one I wrote about when I had first moved overseas, I just experienced a lot of anxiety being really far away from my family and thinking, what if one of them got sick or what if something happened or whatever. And um, I just spent a lot of anxiety thinking about what if things get bad. And I went and I went on a trip with my friend. It was comically difficult, but we went to Dublin and we saw the Book of Kells. Um, and the Book of Kells was this collection. It was a, a gospel collection manuscript created by Irish monks sometime, I think around the ninth century. 
And it was created during the Viking raids when things were kind of continually uh, destroyed, right? They, could, they almost couldn't have monasteries because they would build them and then they would get sacked. They build them, they get sacked. And as I looked at this work of great beauty, um, several things struck me. First, if you're a person who struggles with anxiety or something or something like anxiety, your, your mind is constantly telling you the worst possible thing that could happen, right? And what I realized when I looked at these, um, these books is that the worst possible thing happened to them over and over. Um, and this may sound funny. I guess it's kind of a form of exposure therapy, but I kind of went, okay. Well, so people have always been afraid of the worst thing happening and sometimes the worst thing does happen. Maybe that's just what it is to be alive. You know, maybe we actually have lived in a relatively calm time. And um, so in a weird way, that kind of took some of the, the venom out of the fear in the sense that I'm just like, yeah, I guess people have always felt like the world was going to end. And for the Irish, like it kind of did continually end for several centuries until until a period of peace came. So that was one part of it was just kind of taking taking the venom out of feeling like the world was especially terrible because it's not that it made me think it wasn't terrible. It was more that it made me go, oh, okay, well this is this is just part of the bargain. Okay, I can I can cope with that. Uh, the second thing you may realize though is that you cannot wait to live your life or write the book you need to write or fall in love or do the right thing until everything is okay. Um, because everything will never be okay. And sometimes I'm not saying that things are always the same amount of okay. I do think there are periods of, of peace and, and wartime and there are moments that call for great attention. Uh, but I think looking at that work of beauty made me think, if I live through a time of great difficulty, I just need to decide that other people have too, and that you don't wait to live a good life until things are easy. Um, and then I think also tapping into that sense that also made me reflect on the fact that these monks were not doing this out of a vacuum. They had a very strong sense of Christ's imminent return, the sense that um, life was fragile, but the kingdom of God was always coming. You know, I, I love, I love that sense in, in the gospels of the kingdom of God being present. And that's something that we practice even now at the end of the world, that being a Christian is living for a new kingdom, which is present and is not yet fully here. And so then it kind of gave me a more, a, a sense of agency in the sense that it's not just that the world has always been ending. It's not just that I'm going to live a life well because um, I might as well because it's always been difficult, but also that in living life well and living life in faith, I am actively responding to the brokenness of the world. So that's what that book is about or that chapter is about, um, which both kind of helped me alleviate some of the anxiety just by knowing that I'm a part of the human condition who have all felt this way at numerous times and we're all right to feel this way. Um, but also gave me a sense of agency of how to live well at the end of the world, because it's always kind of the end of the world. Wow. Thank you, Joy. And uh, can't recommend this book enough uh, because we're better off being happy than not, which I think is hard to uh, disagree with. Um, really enjoyed this conversation. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Joy. It's good to see you. It's been a delight. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes or wherever you're listening to this currently and check out plow.com for the digital magazine. You can also subscribe. 32 bucks a year will get you the print magazine or for 99 bucks a year, you can become a member of plow. That membership is an amazing bargain and carries a whole range of benefits from free books to regular calls with the editors to invitations to special events and the occasional gift. Go to plow.com slash subscribe to learn more. Mm -hmm.